Um, a few years ago, uh, my job affords me to travel quite a bit, and oftentimes when I'm gone, my wife will take it upon herself to accomplish things around the house that I haven't gotten done. I was gone from a Thursday to a Tuesday on a, at a work conference, and when I got home on Tuesday, I went about life as normal. It was a full four days. I sat in our, our living room, we were watching TV, and I looked over to my right, and I said, those bricks in the fireplace haven't always been painted white, have they? <laughs> the chair I sit in is seven feet away from that fireplace. I sat there for four days before I noticed. Um, I missed something in a, the sermon text we're going to look at today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have a Bible, you can open up there or a phone app, you can turn that one. Um, maybe you had that experience with Scripture, a, a passage that uh, you have come back to, come back to, come back to over and over and over again. I'm a seminary professor. I'm teaching 1 Corinthians to students starting in two weeks. Um, I, I know this book. I've read this passage numerous times, but I missed it. Uh, the message, and if you're familiar with this passage of Scripture, is actually quite simple. You are the body of Christ. Um, if you're not around church much, that might be an odd thing to hear. But for Christians, it's a very common metaphor. Jesus is the head. We are the body. And it's a launching point for our service to the church and to the world. It's part of what this passage is about, that you have something to contribute to this church and to this community. But there's more going on here than that. Uh, look at the text, beginning at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Paul begins this passage saying that our identity is bound up in Christ and church. Chad Bird on the website 1517 says this, Christianity is not about a personal relationship with Jesus. The phrase is never found in the Bible, and the whole biblical witness runs contrary to it. Our life with Christ is communal, not personal or private or individual. When the scriptures speak of believers, they are part of a community, a fellowship of other believers. I understand a statement like that might be shocking to you. It might be contrary to what you've heard for a long time. But I would argue that it's true. And both verses I just read make that point. The body metaphor emphasizes this. Bodies obviously have many parts. To state the obvious, we together make up the many different parts of Christ's body. That will be expounded on later. But the last phrase of verse 12 is key. Look back. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with He says Christ, <laughs> but what you expect him to say is, so it is with the church. He says Christ, though. The identification of Christians with Jesus is so complete, so total, so all-encompassing that Paul here literally speaks of the church as Jesus. The reality is, if you want to be a Christian, you have to live with all of us. When I was preparing to get married, my wife and I, now wife, we were dating then, and I was going to ask her father, who I hoped would soon be my father-in-law, if I could marry her. Uh, one of the things he said when I got up the guts enough to ask was, if you're going to marry Jill, you get all of us. That meant sisters, their husbands, nieces, nephews. If you're married, you understand that, right? It's the same thing in the church. You want to be a part of the church? You, you got to live with all of us. And Paul explains that. Don't look around at each other, okay? <laughs> Verse 13, he says, for, he explains. 
in our baptism, we are incorporated not just into the life of Christ, but into the life of the church. Look at how Paul reorients their identity. Jews and Greeks, the primary ethnic and religious markers of their day, he says, are subsumed in the communal life of the church. Slaves are free. The primary socioeconomic markers of his day are subsumed in the communal life of the church. We all have our lists of identity markers. But the reality of this passage is that our identity is bound up in Christ and church, not our sexuality, not our gender, not our Enneagram numbers, not the teams we root for or are a part of, not the brands we create for ourselves on social media, not our abilities, our jobs, how much money we make, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. Our thinking is misguided if, as Christians, our identity is not in Christ and the church. But that wasn't the thing I missed when I read this text. I knew that. So I continued on. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Because we are joined together in a single body, all of our diverse gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the church. There was a problem among the Christians in Corinth. What they had done as they had gathered was they started to rank their spiritual gifts in order of how much honor or status they received each granted. An order of importance. Now, they had no problem accepting the truth that they were all part of a single body, but they created a hierarchy of giftedness. And not only were some viewed as more important, but it was viewed as increasing their social standing as well. Now, you would need to read through all of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 to see this, but it seems as though what was held in the highest esteem was speaking in tongues. And there were, there were other gifts like prophecy, teaching, leading, assistance, but they were not seen as imparting as much honor or status. Now, there's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues per se. There's nothing wrong with any spiritual gift. The problem is the belief that some are more important than others. And the natural consequence of the belief that some are more important or honorable is that others are viewed as less important or honorable. So Paul says, verse 14, Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. A church cannot function without diversity of giftedness. Paul extends the body metaphor in several directions here. He says, first of all, there is no inferior. There is only equal important. What's more important, a foot or a hand? Well, what an absurd question. You know, I prefer to have both. The Corinthians knew this. At the site of ancient Corinth, there was a temple to the Greek god Asclepius. And one of the ways that the Greek uh, god Asclepius was worshipped was it was a god of healing. And if you had an ailment in a body part, what you would do is make a plaster or terracotta cast of your body part, take it to the temple of Asclepius, present it there with an offering, and go home and hopefully the god would heal you. These are feet and legs from the archaeological museum in Corinth, uh, these are actual offerings that were made in that temple in Asclepius, to Asclepius. Everyone knows that having a whole, functioning, healthy body is preferable than not. When I was a pastor in Maryland, I was in the hospital room when a 19-year-old kid found out he was going to lose these three fingers due to an, a work accident. He was going to lead a relatively normal life. He was only 19 years old. And you might think it's just three fingers. But if you've ever had someone who's lost a part of their body, you understand that's a difficult thing to deal with. You can't rid the church of the seemingly inferior. That's painful. And if you've ever been made to feel inferior in the church, whoever did that to you is wrong. Everyone here is equally important and valuable. It doesn't make any sense to value one part over the others. What if the whole body was an eye or an ear? 
Whenever I read this passage, I can't help but think of Monty Python's Flying Circus. You remember the cartoon foot, right? That's no body at all, is it? That's just a foot. If everything is one part, that doesn't make any sense. For the Corinthians, speaking in tongues is a valuable contribution. But Paul's saying it's no better than any other spiritual gift. But sometimes we have a similar tendency, don't we? To rank gifts and attach status. Stage versus seats. Administration versus manual labor. Giving money versus giving time. Teaching adults versus teaching children. Sometimes we're more like the Corinthians than we like to admit. The reality is we need everyone here. We need everyone contributing to the healthy functioning of the church. Come back to the text, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. One part can't say to another, that's not necessary. A couple of years ago, my wife, were have, uh, my wife and I were having a new floor put in our kitchen. And in order to save a little bit of money with the contractors, I was going to take the old out. It was in our kitchen. I got in there one day. I was home by myself. And I, I like to do these things as quickly as possible. Right off the kitchen is a door into our driveway. So I pulled up the old tiles, the old linoleum, all of this stuff, the layers, got all the way down to the subfloor, and I'm just throwing it into the driveway, creating another mess for myself. I get done inside, cleaned up a little bit. I thought, okay, I've got to go outside and take care of what's in the driveway. I walked outside and immediately crumbled to the floor because I stepped on a board with a nail in it and went straight through the sole of my shoe into my foot. Pulled the board out of my shoe, <laughs> crawled back into the house, pulled my shoe off, blood everywhere. You know how it goes. Maybe you've been there, right? But I got it cleaned up, and it was just a single puncture wound. Stopped bleeding. I put another sock on, shoe, went back out to the driveway, cleaned up the mess. A few hours later, I sat down. I thought, boy, it would be really nice to take my shoes off. So I grabbed a glass of iced tea, sat down in a chair on the deck, pulled my shoe off, and I realized that my left big toe was three times the size it should have been. And it was at that point that I thought, okay, I need to go to the urgent care and get this taken care of. It's just a toe, right? But I can assure you that something as seemingly inconsequential as a big toe is vitally important to the proper functioning of your body. I couldn't walk. My left leg's been through it. A year and a half ago, I had an accident on a scooter, one of those bird scooters that you rent in the city. Maybe you've seen those. Maybe you've done this. Maybe you've had an accident. A buddy of mine accidentally bumped me on the scooter and off I went. And the first thing that hit the ground was my left knee and then my face. The face was fine, obviously. I looked good. <laughs> but the knee wasn't. They called an ambulance. I went to the hospital, found out that my kneecap had shattered. They were adamant. I did not break it, shattered it. This would happen in Texas, by the way. So I got to get on a plane the next day, get all the way home. And it was the day after Thanksgiving, they pieced my kneecap back together. And two months after that, I had to have a second surgery to scope it out, clean it out a little bit. Now, a kneecap is only about that big. But I can assure you that something as seemingly inconsequential as a kneecap is proper. Uh, the proper functioning of your body depends on it. I'm still recovering from that. There is no small, there is no needless, there is no inferior in the church. It's those smaller, seemingly insignificant, weaker, maybe even less honorable parts of the body that are indispensable to its healthy functioning. The great preacher of the 5th century, John Chrysostom, said, 
What is meaner than the foot? And what is more honorable than the head? For this, the head, more than anything, is the person. Nevertheless, it couldn't do everything on its own. The greater have need of the less, for nothing is dishonorable seeing as it is God's work. God put the body together to give greater honor to those. And whatever your contribution is, here at the church, here in this community, it is necessary and it is important. Christ has no body now on earth but yours, Teresa of Avila said in the 16th century. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which God is to bless people now. Because we are joined together in a single body, all of our diverse gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the church. But that wasn't the thing I missed in this text either. I knew that. What I missed was in this last section of the passage that I've read and studied numerous times. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members in it. And God has appointed in the church, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Does that strike you as odd? Paul has just spent a major section of this letter saying there is no ranking of gifts. And then there are first apostles, second, third. He's just said that no one gift is greater than the others, and he says strive for the greater gifts. <laughs> what is going on here? Here's my opinion. There's no ranking here. The gifts that are listed in this order in Paul's day were needed to establish Christian communities, not the importance or the status or the honor that they gave. In Paul's world, they needed apostles, prophets, teachers, and everything else falls into place as the church comes together to make up the bodies. It was that last statement, strive for the greater gifts that I missed. And it sent me searching, what could that possibly mean? It can't mean that there are gifts that bestow more honor or that some gifts are more important than others or that some are more necessary than others. Strive for the greater gifts, he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, there was no chapter 12. There was no chapter 13 or 14. It was just a letter. We've added the numbers in to help ourselves. Now, I know I'm a seminary professor, okay? So here's your stunning insight for the day. What comes after 12 is 13. You know what chapter 13 is about. Now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the, the greatest... Strive for the greater gifts, he says. And what does he define great as? Love. The greater gifts are those motivated by love toward others and not motivated by love of self. And that can be anything as long as it's done to build up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Let all things be done for building up. I can't believe I missed that. I have a PhD in New Testament studies from a top 20 world university. I have five advanced theological degrees. I've taught 1 Corinthians in Greek to seminarians. I was a pastor for eight years. I am quite literally a professional Christian.
and I miss that. It's easy to get caught up in finding spiritual gifts, finding places to serve that we miss the motivation to do so. It's not ultimately about what I do for the church, but why I do it. And the why must be a love that seeks to build you up. Our service to Christ in church must be motivated by love that seeks the benefits of others, not ourselves. I'm here for your benefit. You're here for mine. I really can't believe I missed that. My encouragement to you is not to make the same mistake I did. 